All right, so welcome back. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit more about how batteries work and why what I built in the last lab actually did work. And maybe that sounds a little confusing. Like, why would I talk about this stuff now instead of first talking about it and then showing it? And I think the answer is, is pretty straightforward and pretty honest, which is this is going to make more sense having seen one of these things in real life first. Now, I want to point out that this is just an overview. It's important to see how Redox works in the real world and how it matters, but just being direct and being honest, this isn't as central to our class or your grade. That's why you've already had like the Redox assessment. That's why there's not homework within this section. The goal of this video is just to give you a basic understanding of this. If we were at Rockhurst right now, we'd be doing this in more depth, but I really would like to get onto the algebra next week, and Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Doyle would as well. And so we're okay giving you kind of just this overview. That's not to say you're not going to be great on this. There is an Ed Puzzle grade today, and I do ask that you pay attention to the questions and give them an honest effort as you're going through them. Kind of think of the two things just being combined. So let's start off by defining this word galvanic cell, because that's definitely new to us. A galvanic cell is a device which uses a redox reduction to make electricity. So that sounds awfully familiar. That sounds a lot like a battery. A galvanic cell is just another name effectively for a battery, although to be fair, there are galvanic cells in chemistry that aren't batteries. Um, rusting is actually a good example. But it's one where we're going to use redox to make electricity. And my guess is the word galvanic is new to us, except maybe in the word galvanized. And it's named for this dude from Italy in the late 1700s named Luigi Galvani. There was also another guy, Andrea Volta, who, for whom the, the Volt is named, a unit, but uh, both deserve some credit. And so I want you to point out that we've known about batteries for more than 200 years, about as long as the United States has existed. So we're going to talk about galvanic cells today. And I'm always going to call them galvanic cells, although you can substitute the word battery when you hear that. What we talk about today is really going to center on this diagram, which I hope looks relatively familiar and looks like the battery you saw me build on Tuesday. And I really want to build up an understanding of what's actually going on in this picture. And so I put a blank version of this thing with your assignment on Google Classroom. It's my suggestion that you kind of work alongside me as your notes today. If you want to pause me and print one of these, or if you'd like to like do this on your iPad and Notability while you watch on your phone or something like that, that would make the class go most smoothly. You also certainly could just quickly pause the video, sketch this thing for 30 seconds, right? Just draw an arch, two beakers, two lines, and a line. I mean, however you want that you could follow along, do that. That's going to make this go most smoothly. So we're going to start off with these two beakers here, right? And into each beaker, we're going to add water and a salt to make a solution. And let's go ahead and label these up. Let's, let's call this one here copper sulfate, C-U-S-O-4. And for this one, let's put zinc sulfate in. And the reason why we're using those two is they're going to help our battery form. Fair enough. They are serving as something which we refer to as an electrolyte. I know you've heard the word electrolyte a lot, like when you're talking about sports drinks and things like that. But no one's probably explained to you like what an electrolyte is. You just know like, oh, when I'm sick, I need an electrolyte. Well, yeah, but what's an electrolyte? So to answer that question, I think the easiest definition is an ionic substance which dissolves in water or more accurately disassociates in water and makes it conductive. Okay. So if I am looking for things that dissolve in water and make it conductive, which of these things could even possibly be used as an electrolyte, right? Uh, some of these wouldn't work by this definition. So take a look at them and figure out which one fits this definition. So let's come back and let's put some metals into our solution. And let's start off over here on the left side of the battery. 
I'm going to find this as the copper cell because we already have copper here. So this piece of metal must be copper. And that copper has a special name. We call it an electrode. Electrode. Now, electrode just means a piece of metal in a battery. Let's leave it at that. So any metals in a solution in a battery is going to be called an electrode. Now, this metal is special. It's copper, and it's elemental copper, which means it's copper all by itself. It's not an ion. It's not copper in a solution. It's just copper metal. So what would its oxidation state be in this situation? Now, this is a zinc solution, and probably unsurprisingly, we're going to put zinc metal in as a strip in the other place. Now, we said this over here was an electrode. And this is metal too. This is zinc and an oxidation state of zero. So what would it be called in this case? So we've got our two electrodes, a copper and a zinc electrode, in our two electrolytes. And we connect them with a wire. We also have this thing here, which we call the salt bridge. And honestly, it's really important, and without it, the battery wouldn't work. But we're also going to effectively ignore it until the very end of this video, because it's the most confusing thing. So, overview, we have two electrolyte solutions, a salt bridge, a wire, and two electrodes. And to understand what's really going on, and to really understand the big question today, which is why is electricity flowing through this wire? Why, with no external power source, why does this thing make electricity? We need to look really carefully at what's actually going on. So what I want to do is I want to zoom in really tight at this area right here. Right? Right at the interface between this electrode and its electrolyte. All right. So here's a zoom in of that area. We have our electrodes here with the really densely packed metals at the zero oxidation state. And then in our electrolytes, we've got some floating around ions, but not nearly as many as we have the metals themselves. Now, I know that electrons have to flow. And my question is going to become, how do I know what happens? Because look, I've got Zn2 plus and Cu2 plus, and both of those things want electrons, right? Both of these things could take electrons to turn into metal. Both of these things are not in their natural state. So both want electrons, and that can't happen because then what would happen is we'd be pulling out and there wouldn't be any electricity. Electricity is the flow of electrons in a certain direction. So in this case, copper will win. Copper gets electrons. And that means zinc has to give electrons. And you might be like, ah, Mr. Nick, how did you know that? Well, I looked at a chart. Think of it kind of like a teeter-totter or a pug of tug of war. Pug of war sounds like a, uh, a very different thing. A very mean looking pug. I don't know. Let's see if Google's got a picture for us. So copper is always going to win this battle for the electrons because it has a stronger pull for electrons. And there's just a chart that we can look at to do that. And I'm not going to make you do that. But what that means is when I connect these things with the wire, right? That means the copper is going to pull electrons away from the zinc and take them because it's better at taking electrons. So what's going to happen is if I have a zinc here, let's kind of look at one here in specific, and I pull electrons away from it. Well, I end up pulling two electrons out of it and into the wire. So this zinc has lost two electrons. So what's its charge now? Now that's zinc 2 plus, but zinc 2 plus has a special property. Zinc 2 plus, it's not a metal anymore. It's in solution. It's dissolving. So this zinc right here, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's left the reaction, right? So this zinc has gone into solution, right? Because by losing electrons, it makes a new substance. And these electrons are now in the wire. And because copper's got a pull, it's going to pull the electrons along until they come into this side of the battery or the galvanic cell. Now the electrons get here and two electrons, two minuses, they can cancel out one of my Cu2 pluses, right? Because if I take these two electrons and this Cu2 plus and I combine them, the plus two and the minus two, they cancel out. And so this Cu2 plus 
becomes Cu. And what would the oxidation state be on Cu again? But here's the thing, Cu's got a special property. Because it's at an oxidation state of zero, it's a metal. So this ion's gone, and this Cu actually joins up and uh, attaches itself to the electrode. So I'm taking metal out of the solution and physically plating it onto the electrode. So what's going to happen to that electrode with time as I run this battery? So here's the trick though. As electrons are being pulled away from the zinc and into the copper, I'm dissolving this electrode and I'm growing this electrode, right? This one's getting bigger, this one's getting smaller. If I run the battery long enough, when the battery quote unquote dies, it's because this, this electrode is gone. It's been used up and this one's gotten so big. And, and so if you look at a dead battery versus a not dead battery, you'd actually see differences in masses here. So to really understand what's going on here, I think we want to look at it through the lens of oxidation reduction. And to do that, I'm going to need to clean up my desk for a moment. So bear with me. All right, so I know this looks messy. Uh, bear with me for a moment. It's actually just a summary of what we've been talking about. Let's start over here on the blue side, which is the zinc electrode being dissolved into solution. And it's dissolving into solution to make these zinc 2 plus ions. So each time that's happening, one of the zincs turns into an ion and this thing gets smaller. And as a result of that, two electrons flow into the wire. Now, I, I've written what's called a half reaction for what's going on here, and let's hold tight on that for a second. Right now, what I want you to do is see the electrons flow through the wire and make it into the copper side of things, right? And when they get here, each time two electrons enter the solution, they're going to attack a Cu2 plus ion and turn it into a metal, which is why this electrode is going to get bigger. I want to point out that on this side we're making ions, and over here we're destroying ions. We're effectively trading metal and ions back and forth. And you can kind of see that here where I've written another half reaction where copper and two electrons make copper metal. So this thing is going on as long as this wire is hooked up and you've got the two pieces of metal in a solution, this is going to keep happening. That's how you can get electricity, right? Because electricity is defined as the flow of electrons through a wire. Well, if I keep doing this, if I keep turning zinc into zinc 2 plus, moving the electrons through the wire and keep turning Cu2 plus into Cu, I have a circuit, if you will, where if I put a load here, if I put like a light bulb or something here, I can extract energy. And in the last video, I said that energy, if you stack up enough batteries, is a lot, right? It's enough to build a car or run a cell phone or whatever. Now, this in itself is enough to talk about what's going on. But I think it's a lot easier if we take all of this and we condense it back into what we're familiar with. So here's a net ionic equation. And you never thought those words would be your friend, but of course they really are. So this reaction is a super easy reaction to diagnose. First thing we're going to need is some oxidation numbers. And let's connect the two things together that are the same. So what's happening to the zinc here? And while we're here, what's happening in the copper is its number goes down. So we have an oxidation and a reduction happening. Just by the way we've drawn this, we know there is redox happening. That over here, I'm losing electrons, and over here, I'm gaining them. By definition, we have an oxidation reduction that makes up this battery. Wait a minute, is there a spectator in this reaction as it's currently written? In this net ionic equation, do we have a spectator? So let's come back to our cell here and use what we just diagnosed to figure out what's actually going on. We can label one of these beakers oxidation and one of them reduction. So Leo says GER. So which thing is oxidation? Now, looking at the diagram, which thing is actually losing electrons in this? Of course, if this is the oxidation cell, this has to be reduction. And you can kind of see that. 2 plus is falling to 0. 
So the number is going down, or you can see it, it's gaining elections, electrons, excuse me. So let's call this the reduction cell. So in a battery, we have an oxidation half cell and a reduction half cell. And the two parts are physically split apart from each other. We have special names for what's going on on these electrodes here. And it's actually worth talking about for just a minute. So our first is going to be the cathode. The cathode is where reduction is going on. And we also have the anode, which unsurprisingly is where oxidation happens. And you can't have a cathode without an anode. They're always partners. And actually, these things show up all the time. They're a big deal if you go farther into science. Cathode and anode are just one of these things that keep coming back up. You might remember, even in our class already, we've talked about the cathode ray experiment that Thompson carried out, right? It proved the electron exists. And the concept we're going through here is related. So we can call the cathode the thing where reduction happens. So, so let's come back to the diagram for a minute. Over here we have a reduction reaction. And we just said that the cathode is where reduction happens. And this is oxidation, and we said that's where anode is. So the cathode is this side, and this is the anode. These pieces of metals, although they're both electrodes, actually have different names. I know this is super messy. So let's take it back to our original diagram and make everything kind of clean and make sense. All right, so here we are. We've got our copper, we've got our zinc, and we have the flow of electrons in the wire to it. And right off the bat, we have labeled this cell the reduction cell, and this cell the oxidation cell. We know that in an oxidation cell, our electrode is called the anode. And in a reduction cell, the electrode is going to be called the cathode. We know in this case that electrons are flowing into the solution. And over here, that electrons are flowing out of the solution. which is another way of saying that this thing is turning into zinc 2 plus. And over here, this thing is being formed by copper 2 plus being reduced. And all of a sudden, we have an actual understanding of a voltaic cell. There's a lot going on in one of those simple batteries. All right. So we're finally back and we can answer the nagging question of, but what's the salt bridge do? Because, well, it tends to bother students that they see it and it's, a, it's the obviously weird part of things. And then we don't talk about it, right? We talk about the anode and the cathode and all these half reactions and it's just kind of sitting there and you're like, yo, what's up? So if this reaction starts, we wouldn't need the salt bridge at all. If you plug it in, everything would work well, but over time the reaction would kill itself. And let's kind of look at why. The zinc keeps turning into Zn2+, and the copper keeps getting rid of Cu2+. Now, these things don't exist in isolation. They have partners. They have a minus. In our case, it's SO4 2 minus. The SO4 doesn't participate in the reaction directly, right? It's not part of our net ionic equation, right? It doesn't show up here. So what's it called again if, if something is present in the reaction but doesn't participate? But just because it's a spectator doesn't mean it's not important, right? Because I can't have naked pluses or, or naked minuses. And so as this thing happens, these pluses go away. So this side, this side of things is going to get more negative. And this side is going to get more positive if I leave things by themselves, right? And I need a way to balance that because eventually these charges would build up to be so big that the reaction would stop. And that's where the salt bridge comes in. See, mixed in in here, because it's an ionic salt, are already ions just waiting to go. 
and they're a mix of plus and minus. Now, in the reaction that we did at school, I used sodium sulfate, but it doesn't really matter as long as there's just pluses and minuses in here. And what's going to happen is this, this thing becomes more plus. Well, the minuses from the salt bridge are going to flow in. And as this thing becomes more minus, well, the plus is going to flow in. So if you want to think about it, what's happening in the salt bridge, uh, let me draw a different color here, is it's kind of split down the middle, right? And over here, the plus side flows, and over here, the minus side flows. So what it's acting like is a balance. So I said this is kind of like a teeter-totter there on. Well, this is the thing with the finger on the teeter-totter pushing it down so everything stays level. right? This is the thing that lets the reaction keep going for any length of time. And it's this part of things in most battery chemistry that's really the hard thing to get right. The electrolyte and salt bridge is really what's going on. And that's why, like in a lemon battery, which you might have seen in a science fair picture, kind of like this. Well, that's one of the reasons why those work kind of short term. The citric acid in there is a great electrolyte until it runs out, until the charges become disproportionate. My uh, solutions that I built at school, they work, but they would lose their balance very quickly. This, this whole thing works together as a system. And I hope what you appreciate at the end of this is that it's actually quite complicated what's going on inside of a battery. And these are the simple ones. Let me be, be clear, like actually doing anything good with these batteries requires you to build a lot of them. And actually building a battery that, you know, can actually have an appreciable amount of like electrical power in a space that's not massive, like something like this, an iron battery, that takes even more. These things are brilliant. They really are. And you might notice this has taken us a long time just to diagnose a simple model. And getting into electrochemistry would be very difficult. That's one of the reasons why uh, Mr. Doyle, Mr. Sullivan and I have talked and where we've kind of chosen to do this overview just for one day. So being clear, we're not going to hold you too accountable to this. The main goal right now is just for you to have seen it. So I'm going to do one more thing with you today, and I'm, I'm hoping it only takes a couple minutes. I'm going to go back to a blank diagram, and let's just ask several ed puzzle questions in a row. Let's just make sure you kind of come out of here saying, okay, I get something of what's come on in this video. All right, so welcome back to the lab. What's the name of this arched piece of glass that helps keep the charges balanced as the battery runs? All right, so now I've circled the copper cell. And in the copper cell, the copper goes from the plus two state down to copper zero, the metallic form. So what's going on here? Is that oxidation or reduction? Because it's reduction, we have a name for what's going on here. Is this the anode or the cathode? So now pulling back and looking at the battery, this is still incomplete. This battery as it's made wouldn't work. Why not? So I've hooked up a wire in this picture now. Which direction would electrons flow? So the goal here was to understand a little bit more about how oxidation reduction actually works. And I hope you understand there's both a level of simplicity, which is the just oxidation reduction, and a level of really quite complexity as well, which is you've got to do things just right to actually make something useful. So hopefully at the end of this, you come away with some of that appreciation. Um, but for better or worse, we move on to gas laws on Monday. So I look forward to seeing you then and kind of introducing that topic. Uh, until then, I hope you have a great weekend. Be gentle to each other. Y buen camino.